I am going to discuss reparations in three statements. First, I'll introduce libertarianism, which is the philosophy from which I will analyze reparations. Second, I will try to apply reparations to slavery. And third, I'll try to apply the libertarian theory uh, of reparations to land reparations from Indians or uh, people such as that, uh, conquistadores. So first, what is libertarianism? Libertarianism is the philosophy that is predicated on the non-aggression principle. It says you can do anything you want as long as you keep your hands off of other people and their property. So this opens up the question, well, how do you get property? Well, we start with the individual. We each own ourselves. Sort of homesteading. Uh, when my children were uh, six months old or a year old, I could kiss them all the time I wanted. No problems. <laughs> then they became about two years old, and they start going like this. <laughs> like they're taking control of their bodies. They, they seem to think they own themselves, which is horrible, because <laughs> I was having a great time kissing them all I wanted, and now they seem to own themselves. They're sort of homesteading themselves. When they're six months old, they're not really in control of themselves at all. Two or three, they start to own themselves. So we own ourselves. Therefore, slavery is a theft. Unless it's voluntary slavery. So if one of my children is very sick, and uh, what's your name? Marcelo. Marcelo wants to have me as a slave, but he's very rich, and my child will die unless I have five million dollars, and Marcelo will give me five million, I'll give it to my, my son's doctors, will save his life, and now I'm his slave, because I agreed to be. But that's very unusual. Usually slavery is somebody grabs you and makes you a slave. Okay, so we have the non-aggression principle and we have homesteading of the person first and then we have homesteading of land. How do you get to own land? Well, you mix your labor with it. This is John Locke, John Locke's theory. You mix your labor, you grow a crop, you domesticate a cow and the cows uh, eat the, the corn and now you own the, the fields. Okay, so this is roughly a very short introduction to what libertarianism is non-aggression, private property, persons and in land. And then we have another legitimate title transfer. Once you own land, you can trade it if you want. So if I uh, domesticate a cow and you grow corn, and I milk the cow and I trade the milk for the corn, now I have corn even though I didn't produce the corn, and you have milk even though you didn't produce the milk, that's also legitimate. Any voluntary interaction such as trade or gifts or anything like that. Okay, so that's the introduction to libertarian theory. A lot of people on the right think that reparations is theft. But to me, it's not true. Uh, if, uh, what, what's your name? Vera. 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 If I stole this watch, if my grand, if I stole this watch from Vera, and she repossesses it, this is just because it's her watch, and I took it from her. Now suppose my grandfather took it from her grandfather, and my grandfather gave it to my father, and my father gave it to me, and now she sees me wearing the watch, and she has pictures of her grandfather wearing it, and we assume that it really is his. We adopt the God's eye view, so we don't uh, dispute this. Well, and she comes to me and says, well, that's my watch, give it back. Or my grandfather would have given it to my father, and my father would have given it to me, so you give it to me because you never should have had this in the first place. It seems just. I should give her the watch. And this is not a violation of property rights. This is the embodiment of property rights. This is the way property rights should work. We should take stuff from the thief and give it to the proper owner. No, I'm not a thief. I'm innocent. I shouldn't go to jail. I shouldn't be punished. But I have no right to this watch. Okay. Slavery. We have slaves. 
slavery is unjust. We're not talking voluntary slavery, and most of my experiences in the U.S., I don't know the Argentine situation as well, but in the U.S., black people were captured from Africa, taken to the U.S., and forced to work. And then in 1865, when the war between the states was over, slavery was ended. So what should have happened then in a libertarian society? What should have happened then is that the slave masters and the overseers and the people who brutalized slaves should have been punished. They should have been enslaved. And all their property should have been taken away from them because the slave can't own any property. And these people are now properly slaves, namely they're criminals and they're being punished. This, as an aside, is the libertarian theory of punishment. If I take her watch, I should be not only made to give it back, but I should be put in jail, but not put in, you see, right now, I'm put in jail, and she has to pay more money to keep me in jail. And then I have air conditioning, at least in the United States, I have a color TV, and a, it's a wonderful thing, jail, well, not that one, no. <laughs> but she's victimized twice. Once, I, I take her watch, and secondly, I go to jail, and she pays for me through taxes to be in jail. No, I should be put in jail and made to engage in forced labor, and the difference between the amount that I can earn in forced labor and what it costs to feed me should go to her, to compensate her for the theft that I imposed on her. But that's an aside. Okay, so slavery, 1865, is over. And uh, all of the property of the ex-slave masters should go to the slaves. So here's a plantation, there are 500 slaves. Let's say we divide the land and the cattle and everything else in 500 pieces. So now each slave gets uh, 10 acres and a mule, something like that. And that would have been justice, but it didn't happen. What happened was slavery was ended and then the slaves were set free to, to work and the master kept his plantation. And now it's uh, 2011, and there's some black person who lives in Harlem, which is a black area in New York City, and he comes to the Libertarian Justice Court and says, my great-grandfather worked on that uh, plantation in South Carolina. And I can prove it. The burden of proof is on me. For the libertarian, any property title is assumed to be just. The burden of proof is on anyone who wants to change property titles. So this black person comes to the court, and the, the court uh, says, well, prove it. And he proves it. Don't ask how. There's a picture. I don't know if there were pictures then. See, the problem with proving, you see, this is a very radical position philosophically. But practically, the further back you go in history, the harder it is to prove anything. We don't have pictures. If you go back to the Indians, native Indians in the US, you don't even have a written language. So it's harder to prove. But if it could be proved that this guy uh, had his great grandfather on this plantation, uh, and there were 500 slaves, he should get one 500th of that plantation. It seems just to return stolen property because in the just society, his great-grandfather would have had uh, 10 acres of that plantation. Now it's possible, again, the, the white person who is now the great-grandchild of the slave master, he might say, well, you know, this is mine. I got it from my father, but he never should have got it. It was unfair for his father or grandfather to give it to him because he was not the proper owner of it. Okay, that's for slavery. That was the second part of my analysis. Now, the third part, and then I have some objections that I'll deal with. The third part is, well, what about Indian claims? Should we give back the whole United States back to the Indians? Because the Indians were there first. The white people came and brutalized them, killed many, and threw the rest of them off their land. Maybe we should give it all back. No. 
Usually when I, I say this to American audiences, I get applause. <laughs> they, they want to keep their land. They don't want to give it all back to the Indians. Right now in the US, there are about 370 million people. And if you go up in an airplane west of the Mississippi, it looks like no one's there. The whole place is empty. Even east of the Mississippi, you see uh, Chicago, you see Memphis, and then darkness at night. The, the place is empty. There are very, very few people there. The estimates are that when the white man came and started killing the Indians, there were only two million Indians. Many tribes, but each tribe, uh, 200, 300, very small tribes, all together two million. So if 375 million can't fill the United States, two million, they couldn't occupy very much. Maybe a percent or two or three percent of the land. So the issue does not even arise. Even assuming they can prove anything, which is problematic, because there was no written language, no photographs or anything like that. In Canada, the Indian tribes have claimed about 300% of Canada. <laughs> Namely, there are many tribes, uh, several hundred tribes, and each tribe says, oh, we own this and we own that, and there are overlapping claims. So when you add up all the claims, they own 300% of Canada. But there's only 100% of Canada, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the law of logic. You can't create more than 100% of Canada. So somebody must be lying. And, and the courts, instead of asking for proof, this would be racist to ask for proof. <laughs> they say, here's some old Indian. He says, ah, oh, we own from this uh, river to that river. And they listen to him. This is not justice. Justice means you have to prove something. The burden of proof is on he who wants to change titles, not on hearsay and, oh, my grandfather told me this, we own this from this tree to that boulder. This isn't proper uh, legal procedure. Now, there are some cases where there was a treaty between the United States government and the tribe, and then they discovered the coal and they kicked them off, and, and there there is written record. Okay, that would be more legitimate. But in the vast number of cases, there's just no claim for that. The Japanese Americans during World War II, now here, World War II, 1942, 1943, uh, you had pictures, you had uh, uh, written language, you had pictures of them sitting on their fishing boat or a picture on their uh, Model T Ford or whatever it was, and th there is proof, well, <clears throat> then it should be given back to them, even if innocent people bought it. Even if innocent people bought it. So getting back to this uh, plantation in South uh, Carolina, if the guy who is there is not related but purchased it from the grandson, it's too bad. He should have had title insurance better title insurance. The rightful owner is the great-grandson of the black slave, if he can prove it. And it doesn't matter how many times it's been sold, every time it was sold, it was an illegitimate sale. Okay, so we talked about the Indians uh, with land, the blacks with slavery, the Japanese Americans. Now, the conquistadores in Latin and South America, which have vast plantations, I'm much less knowledgeable about that. I have an article co-authored with uh, Mr. Yates, Guillermo Yates. Uh, he knows more about the situation, and I knew the philosophy, so we combined in making uh, an article on this. And what we say is, if the people can prove that the latifundia, I guess it's called, the vast plantations, uh, there were innocent people homesteading the land and then they were conquered by the grandparents of the present owners. It has to be returned to them. One ameliorating fact is that land usually accounts for only 10% of GDP. So we're not talking about giving everything, giving the store away. It's an expression, don't give the store away. So even if all the land were given, you're only talking about 10% of the GDP. 
and not all the land would be given because we're now at a time where the proof of the conquistadores is many years and many years ago. It's hard to prove anything. So as I say, the theory is very, very radical in philosophy. But in actual practice, when it comes to stuff two, three, four hundred years ago, not so radical because it's hard to prove and the burden of proof is on the people who would uh, change. But the Japanese Americans, much more modern. Now how about Israel and Palestine? What happened 2,000 years ago? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. I mean, now we're talking a long time ago. It's true there was written records, but 2,000 years is hard. So it's very difficult to apply this theory, except to say that whatever the land titles are, up until the time that we uh, had some uh, modern records and pictures and stuff like that, whoever was the owner was the, the rightful owner. So here's a libertarian theory that is applied to all sorts of areas over history, all over the world. Hopefully it sheds some light on, on very difficult problems. It doesn't have definitive answers in the sense that the purge of proof, again, as I say, is on the uh, person who wants to overturn, and the further back you go, the, the harder it is to prove. Okay, I've now done the three things I said I would do, and I still have some time, so I'll deal with some objections to this theory. Uh, there are... Uh, Horowitz is a writer in the United States, a conservative. He used to be a left-wing person, and he changed to the right. And he's against any reparations. He thinks reparations are a violation of private property. He has 10 objections. I don't know that I'll get to all 10, but let me uh, talk a few. Uh, his has to do mainly with slavery, not with land ownership. First he says, well, there were black slave catchers. See, the, the, the radical blacks want all the whites and non-blacks Orientals, whoever is in the United States, to be taxed, and then vast amounts of money to be given to blacks. Well, that's not exactly the theory that I've been uh, advocating. My theory is to take it away from the children of slave owners, not from everyone. Uh, the problem is that some blacks came over from Africa to the United States 10 years ago. What did they, they don't have any grandparents who were slaves in the United States, so they can't get anything. Then there were some whites or Orientals who came over in the last 10 years and had no connection with slavery whatsoever. Why should they be taxed? So this guy, Randall Robinson, the black person who is advocating vast amounts of uh, redistribution, uh, I disagree with him. Uh, namely, he favors uh, reparations, but he favors reparations in a non-libertarian uh, direction. Whereas I favor only reparations based on libertarianism. So I reject him. Horowitz writes mainly against Robinson, saying Robinson is crazy. And Horowitz does make good objections to Robinson. But he makes no objections, I think, that are successful to the libertarian theory. I sent him the article I wrote, Horowitz, attacking Horowitz, and he never replied. So. <laughs> Who knows what, what he thinks, but um, the article that I wrote on this, apart from Guillermo Yates, was just on an attack on Horowitz. And uh, I'm now going to go through some of the objections that he uh, mentions. So the first thing he mentions is that there were black slave catchers who captured other blacks in Africa. And then there were some black slave owners in the United States. So therefore, money shouldn't go from whites to blacks. And he says, well, therefore, we shouldn't have any reparations at all. But no. The reparations should go from the, grand, from the black grandchildren of the slaves, or rather, should be taken from the black grandchildren of the slave owners and given to the black grandchildren of the slaves. <laughs> So Horowitz doesn't think of that. He just says, well, since there were black slave owners, you can't have any reparations. But that's not correct. Um, so only, uh, one of the, another argument is only whites benefit from slavery. 
And my <coughs> argument here is it doesn't matter who benefits from slavery. Look, I benefit from Mozart. I like Mozart. I benefit from Mozart. I don't owe Mozart anything or his children or anything like that. Benefit and harm is very different than rights violations. Look, if I open up a grocery store across the street from your grocery store and I, quote, steal half your customers, you can't sue me, even though I harmed you. So there are legitimate ways of harming each other and benefiting each other. And whether someone harms someone or benefits someone, it does not give rise to a proper lawsuit. The only thing that gives rise to a proper lawsuit for libertarians is a violation of the non-aggression act. There were paintings taken from Jewish homes that are sitting in German museums. And the, uh, this was in World War II or in the 1930s when you had pictures and, and uh, proof. That should all go back to the grandchildren of the Jews from whom it was taken because it's easy to prove that. It should not be in a German museum or in a German collection because Hitler took it from them. It should go back to the grandchildren. That's an easy one and that's in the modern era. Another argument of Horowitz is you have wealthy blacks like Opera Winfrey and LeBron James and uh, Tiger Woods, the, uh, the golfer, very, very rich. And therefore, we shouldn't give blacks like them any money. And that's crazy. I mean, again, if my grandfather took the watch from her grandfather, even if she's rich, I still owe her the watch. Rich people can be uh, rightful owners of things. Somehow he thinks that because there are rich blacks, they shouldn't get any money. Well, maybe based on Randall Robinson's theory of giving money from rich to poor, that's true, but the libertarians have no such view that you take money from rich people and give it to poor people. No. You take money from thieves and give it to the rightful owner or their grandchildren. Another argument is that we'll have resentment if we have reparations. Whites will resent make being forced to give blacks reparations. Well, as a libertarian, I don't care if people resent things. I care about justice. So people resent things doesn't matter. Another one is that the Civil Rights Act and welfare were a form of reparations. The 1964 Civil Rights Act ended Jim Crow legislation where blacks were not allowed to they were forced to ride in the back of the bus, and they were not allowed to uh, uh, walk on the street. They were not allowed to do a lot of things. So what Horowitz is saying is that we had already given blacks reparations. So why what this call for more reparations? We had the Civil Rights Act. Well, the Civil Rights Act, uh, this is guy, everyone probably knows Rand Paul, uh, Ron Paul. Well, Ron Paul's son, Rand Paul, made a claim while he was running for the Senate of uh, Texas, uh, Kentucky. Kentucky, thanks, I think all that might get on U.S. situation. He is now the senator for Kentucky, and when he ran, he said the Civil Rights Act was part good, namely stopping this violation of black people's rights, but part bad, because it violated the law of free association. Namely, it said blacks, can, you can't discriminate against blacks. You can't set up a lunch counter and say no blacks allowed, or blacks have to go to the back of the restaurant, or something like that. And Rand Paul correctly said, this is a violation of property rights. If I own something, and I'm innocent, I haven't committed any crime, and I don't want, let's say I'm a gay man, and I don't want women in my store, I have a right to do it. I mean, it might not be economically viable, but it's my store. And what's the difference between my store and my house? Both private property. And they've even gone to extremes about the discrimination against women, blacks. I mean, the United States is crazy on, on that thing. And I have a reductio ad absurdum against them. The reductio ad absurdum is male homosexuals are evil. I know it's not politically correct to say it, but I'll say it anyway, <laughs> because they refuse to go to bed with half the human race. <laughs> <laughs> Female homosexuals, lesbians, are evil. 
because they too refuse to go to bed with half the human race, namely any man. Heterosexual men and heterosexual women also are evil because they also are prejudiced against half the human race. The only people who are legitimate are bisexuals. <laughs> so we should have compulsory bisexuality. <laughs> Everyone should be forced to go to bed with, at least once with somebody that they don't want to go to bed with. I mean, that's the logic of these crazy laws. But truth to tell, even bisexuals discriminate. They discriminate in favor of beauty, of sense of humor, uh, things like that. I mean, they're normal people. But that's what people do. They discriminate. It used to be a a compliment to say he's a discriminating man. Now, you say he's a discriminating man, he's halfway to jail. <laughs> so, this is crazy. Uh, so, the Civil Rights Act was not a, a, a... Part of it was legitimate, and part of it you could look upon it as reparations, but the other part was illegitimate. And then uh, it talks about, well, what about welfare? Many blacks are disproportionately on welfare. And the problem with that, it's not really a benefit. Because welfare destroyed the black family. You know, there's this thing in biology, if you throw a frog into boiling water, it jumps out. If you put a frog in cold water and you heat it up slowly, the metabolism of the frog is such that it stays there and gets boiled. Well, slavery was like boiling water for the black family. It did not destroy the black family. Yes, it destroyed the black family during slavery because the husband was sent here and the wife was sent there. Yes. But after slavery in the 1870s and 1890s, there was ads in the paper. Joseph was on this plantation looking for Catherine. Where are you? And they got together. There were groups that would try to put them together. In the 1910 census, the black family and the white family was almost the same intact. The black family is a little worse. Intact means uh, marriage and not divorce. Then came welfare in uh, 1965 with uh, Johnson's Great Society. And they gave a, a pregnant girl a lot more money than the husband or the father of her child could give. And they made a rule that if she was with him, she couldn't get the money. And previously to that, if you were pregnant and without a husband, it was a disgrace. Black family, white family, whatever, it was a disgrace. You had to go live with your aunt until you had the baby, and then the baby was given up for adoption. But so many uh, black girls, and the reason it was more on black girls is because they're poorer than white girls. And when the government gave welfare, it gave food stamps and medicine and an apartment and a, a lot of money. And no longer was it a disgrace to be pregnant without marriage. In some black communities, 70% of the children are without a mother and a father together, husband and wife. And this is very important. It's a big creator of poverty. Because when you come from an intact family, blacks, you are not in the poverty level, or very few percent. Most of the black people in poverty are in poverty because the family is not formed. So this was no reparations. This was worse. They should, maybe they should get reparations for having welfare imposed on them. Another one is um, blacks owe whites for liberating them from slavery during the Civil War, and therefore they already had their reparations. A lot of white people died in the Civil War in order to free the slaves. But this too is problematic. Jeff Hummel and Tom DiLorenzo have done research on this and shown that it really shouldn't be called a Civil War. A civil war is between two parties, each of one, each of whom wants to take over the country. Like the Spanish Civil War in 1936 was a true civil war because the fascists and the communists each wanted to take over all of Spain. But 
what happened in 1861 was not a, uh, a civil war, it was rather a war of secession. The South didn't want to take over the North. The South just wanted to secede from the North. So it wasn't a civil war. And the point that Tom DiLorenzo makes, and other historians, is that Lincoln didn't favor freeing the slaves. Lincoln only favored keeping the country together. And Lincoln made statements to the effect, if I can keep the country together and end slavery, I'll end slavery. If I can keep the country together and keep slavery, I'll keep slavery. He didn't care about slavery. So this is hardly a reparation. Now there are several other objections, but I said I'd only go for a half hour, and it's now a half hour. So I'll end the formal discussion, and I'll say that uh, we can certainly discuss this issue, and I talked about it for a half hour, so I hope there'll be at least some discussion of this, but if you want, I'm open to any discussion of anything pertaining to libertarianism uh, that you might want to raise. So, who, yes, sir. Um, I was trying to make an analogy against the economy. Uh, we have net winners and net losers. We pay taxes, other receive benefits. Also, we have uh, regulations that harm the poor, like such as pay barriers that uh, specifically the poor have to provide. And uh, all, of, all of the, those kinds of interventions are harming people. And sh shall, shall we repair the intervention? Who should pay for that? There is um, a very famous black economist. Thomas Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L, -L, who I'm a big fan of, and he makes, and Walter Williams, another black economist, see they can say things that it's hard for me to say, <laughs> and I say I'm not a racist, when they say I'm, uh, well, it's hard to call them a racist, no, you call them a um, Oreo cookie? Oreo. Yeah. All right, I'm on the inside. <laughs> right on the inside. <laughs> You know, you think that blacks, they have to be respected by the blacks, no. Uh, so uh, what Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and others say is, slavery is forced labor. Well, if I tax you 40% of your labor, <laughs> it's forced labor. Now, there are differences, it's not a perfect analogy, but there are very blatant similarities. So yes, when the libertarian Nuremberg trials start, let me repeat that. <laughs> when the libertarian Nuremberg trials start, remember for Germany they had yes, Nuremberg. Nuremberg trials for uh, the Nazis. Well, when we take over after Ron Paul wins, <laughs> the people who uh, tax us and uh, have price controls on us are going to be uh, in the dock and we're going to see if they go to jail or not. I once got into a big trouble, a big fight with a guy named Stephen Horowitz. Um, where I said that not only should we get rid of the minimum wage law, but we should put in jail people who are responsible for having the minimum wage law because the minimum wage law makes it impossible for young black people to work, which is a crime. And Stephen Horowitz, different, uh, this guy is Horowitz that I was talking about. This is Stephen Horowitz, H-O-R-W-I-T-Z. <coughs> He said, with friends like Walter Block, we don't need enemies. <laughs> so I wrote back in, and I said, well, why? What's your view? What should be done to people guilty of minimum wage? But by analogy, any of these other things you mentioned. And he said, well, I don't have to answer that question. I said, what? <laughs> How are we going to have a dialogue? <laughs> How are we going to settle this if you don't answer? But he never answered. And other people wrote in saying, you know, trying to moderate and say, well, you know, give Walter a break, you know, tell him why he's wrong, <laughs> set him straight, but he never did. So I think you're making a very good point. And I think that people responsible for tariffs and uh, price controls and inflation, and, and the list goes on and on, uh, many of them should go to jail, but not cozy, comfortable jails with air conditioning and color TVs. <laughs> but jails where they work hard to compensate those of us who've been victimized by these things, namely working people or people with businesses. Now, this is very radical. I don't think Ron Paul will be elected if <laughs> this gets out, so don't tell him. <laughs> but I can't speak for him. I don't know if he agrees with this, but this seems to me to be a lot of the implication of libertarianism, and it's all his fault. 
He said it first. I'm innocent. I'm just led by him. No, I'm kidding. I, I've written about this and I fully agree with you. Yes? And um, let's say, since in the um, 18th or 19th century, there, there was not a possibility for a slave to have private property. Wouldn't it be to uh, apply retroactively a law? Because in the present, if we know that black people can have property, but back in the 18th century, they couldn't. Wouldn't it be to take a law from the present and apply retroactively, which is not a liberal, at least a liberal principle, you know? I mean, a libertarian principle. Well, I, I'm in favor of retroactive law. They say that the, what is it, the ex post law is illegitimate? Yeah, ex post law. Ex post yeah. law is supposed to be illegitimate, but the Nuremberg trials were an exercise in ex post law. And they were illegitimate. <coughs> they were very illegitimate. And right. the Nazis' uh, defense was I was just following orders. But the point of ex post law is you shouldn't have been following that. And so I, sir, I agree with you also. I hate to be so agreeable. Usually I like to disagree. Ah. <laughs> I, I call him as I see him. Now I think that as a matter of fact, slaves were allowed to own private property. Ah. Uh, not land, but uh, you know, uh, a hat, pants, shirt, something like that. Children's toys, things like that. Um, they, they were allowed to own some property. Uh, which leads me to another discussion. Would slavery have failed without any wars? And all through Latin and South America, slavery was ended without any big wars. Only in the United States, I think, was there gigantic clashes over this. Slavery was problematic on two grounds. One, uh, this is sort of the Marxists talk about the internal contradictions of capitalism. Well, this is the internal contradictions of slavery. If you wanted to get more work out of your slave, you would teach him how to read and write, because then the slave would be more productive. But if you taught him how to read and write, this would undermine slavery, because if no black could read or write, then you could let them go from South Carolina to Virginia with a thing written by the master saying, my slave Joe has permission to go from here to there to pick up uh, a horse. But if the slaves can write, they can write letters as if coming from the boss. So here you have one contradiction. On the one hand, to get more value out of your slave, you teach him or her to write and read. On the other hand, that undermines slavery. The second one is manumission, namely freeing the slave when they're 65 or 70 or something like that. See, without manumission, if there's any black person, you know he's a slave. It's clear. But with manumission, it's no longer so clear and easy to keep track of slaves. So what the government of the North had to do was have fugitive slave acts. Namely, people would come up from the South and see a black person say, that's my slave, whether he was or not, they'd grab him back. And the North supported this. But without that sort of support, slavery would have ended sooner. So these are some of the contradictions of slavery. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I really like the contrarian point of view of this, of preparations. But uh, I use it a lot from the, from with people in debates from the left and from the right. But from the libertarian point of view, I, I believe it's important because you are assuming that the heritage is from family to family. And that's not correct from the libertarian point of view. So it's so so. I see your point, and it, it's a not unreasonable point. First of all, let me uh, agree with something you said, where you said it's neither left nor right. In my view, and I think this is a very important point, that libertarianism is not left or right. We're unique. We're libertarian. I think of it as a three-legged stool with the right here and the left there, and libertarians here. We're equally distant from the left and the right. We agree more with the right on economics they're not as bad as the Marxists, but we agree more with the left on imperialism and foreign wars where nobody attacked us and we're killing people. And uh, we agree more with the left on legalizing drugs and pornographic and prostitution, although the feminists now are supposedly on the left and they're against it, so it's complicated. <laughs> but, so I, I agree with this. 
Now, you're making a good point. How do we know that her grandfather would have given the lunch to her father and then her father would have given it to her? The whole thing is predicated on that. But this is a not unreasonable empirical generalization. There's no necessity. Sometimes grandfathers cut out the father from the will and give it to charity or give it to whoever. But probably in 90, 95, 98% of the cases, this is what's done. And we're trying to be like a libertarian law court. And we have to go along with the culture and the practice, the actual practice. So if somebody said, well, it's crazy. Her, great, her grandfather never would have given it to her father. We'd say, you know, what are you dreaming? Or, because that's the usual practice. But you're quite right, this is a weak read to base the argument. The argument stands or falls based on that. But I think the burden of proof would be on someone to say, well, her grandfather hated her father and didn't give him anything else, so why would he have given him the watch? And if you can make that case, well, then I'm keeping the watch because your grandfather wouldn't have given it to your father because he hated him. And what about the statute of limitations? Do you, do you no statute of limitations. Not the case. That, that's a very good question. In my view, there's no statute of limitations on justice. Rather, there's a natural statute of limitations, namely the further back you go, the harder it is to prove anything. <laughs> but if you can prove it, if we can prove that this watch was really her grandfather's, and now we say, well, it's too late, it's uh, statute of limitations is 75 years or whatever, or 100 years, and now case closed, what about justice? Justice is non-time dimensional, yeah, so you don't relate the concept of justice with safety or security well, transactions? Well, I don't care about safety or security when they conflict with justice. Now, I have a view that justice and safety and security are positively correlated, not negatively correlated. But if we look for justice, we'll find safety and security too. And if we give up on justice, we'll lose safety and security also. Not always. You can think of cases, weird cases, but as an empirical generalization, uh, from the deontological point of view of justice, there should never be a time limitation on justice, except this natural one that I talked about. Uh, young lady, and then uh, Professor, would you say that this understanding of justice is holding responsible an individual for misconducts or mis? Uh, yeah, misconducts of their ancestors. When, how come I am responsible for whatever my grandfather, whom by the way I had hated, for all the things he done to my parents, how come I am responsible for his misconducts? Well, we're not putting you in jail. You're no, no, but I, when you're putting me in the position to give away whatever is mine now. Whatever is part of what is yours now that you never should have got in the first place. See, we're not going to, let's say your grandfather or great-grandfather was a slave owner. And, and uh, we know that he, that, that red shirt you're wearing, the, the red blouse you're wearing, that, that blouse was stolen from my great-grandfather. Let's say. And I can prove it. And your great-grandfather stole that red shirt from mine, and he gave it to his son, and gave it to his son, and gave it to you. I'm not saying you should go to jail. You're not guilty. There's no mens rea. She's innocent. But that red shirt, she has to give it up because she never should have got it in the first place. So yes, I'm taking something that you think you own, but you're mistaken in thinking that you own it. You really don't own that. It was stolen property, and I can prove it, let's say. Well, she has to give that red shirt to me. Give me that shirt. You only have the right to recover the original property of the. That was stolen. Yeah, yeah. nothing else. Mm -hmm. She's got many other shirts. If, uh, if her father had served, already sold the shirt and buy another thing, you can prove that the new thing can from the from selling you this shirt. If mm -hmm. if I can prove that. Yeah. Then, look, suppose that she now sells the red shirt to the lady next to her for that um, 
What is it? Scarf. 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 And now she's got a scarf. Now the scarf was never stolen, but the red shirt was. And I now go to this lady and I say, hey, that red shirt, you don't own it. But you have to prove that oh, you buy the scarf by selling the... Absolutely. The burden of proof is on he who wants to take scarves or shirts away from people. And as a matter of practicality, this isn't going to happen. Maybe with land a little bit, it could. But we have to be open to this. Otherwise, we're, we're like conservatives, saying that property is sacrosanct and no one should ever give any stolen property back. I, I said I'd call him Guillermo, and then I'll call him you. Then I would get to this. Refer to Argentina specifically, because what you're talking about is very general and very American subject. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not your fault, but no, we, we, it's, it's good to discuss our uh, problems also. In, in Argentina, slavery wasn't the central point as a subject as in the States. Because in 1813, it, the liberty of wombs was declared. So, uh, the children of slaves were free, and slaves who came into our actual territory became free people for the fact of coming into Argentina. So that's not a subject. The subject that's getting forced now is the uh, original inhabitants of the Argentine territory. Well, the whole Argentine territory was populated by about 200,000 Indians. And in the, in, in the actual time, the present time, the, the ones who claim more for lands are the Mapuches that are originally Chileans and that came to the Argentine territory to steal cows and write them to change. So it's more a political subject than a, a question of uh, justice. Because in, including the, the inhabitants of Argentina, they were mostly no one. So they couldn't say, this land was mine because they didn't uh, <laughs> exercise a property because they just hunted and fished. And, no? Well, the Indians. And if, if that is taken to the last consequence, we should all, all the present, all the Argentine presidents that are present at this moment in this room, should get on the ships and go away again. Uh, well, being I, taken that that reason to the street. Well, I uh, have to apologize because my knowledge of the Argentinian history no, is no. not as good as it could be or should be, but the, you know, there's so much to learn and you can't learn everything. No, <laughs> it's okay, I, I'm not all I, all I can do is give general principles. Now, I know the Indians, nomads in the United States, didn't mix their labor with the land. They didn't grow much of anything. All they did was hunt for buffalo and maybe picks and berries. And that doesn't grow titles. So the the land wasn't that doesn't grow titles. I, I can't read. That, that does not grow titles. Well, I think it does a little bit. <sighs> Namely, the more you mix your labor with the land, the more definite is your land title. But to say that they have no land title whatsoever, I think, is too much the other way. I'm a moderate. They call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> and I think a moderate position is appropriate here. Typically, what the Indian nomads did in the United States, and again, I apologize for Not. the lack of Argentinian, what they did in the United States, and probably the nomads here did similar things, is they had a, a northern territory in, in the summer of five square miles, and then they had a path down to New Mexico or Texas, where they stayed in the winter when it was cold up north. And I think they own five square miles here and a path down to the five square miles there. But when you talk about five square miles, it's nothing. I mean, in Texas, the ranch is, uh, you know, the 100 square miles. So if the Indians were 200,000 in, in all of Argentina, there's no way that they could have homestead, even with the most expansive definition of homesteading, the whole country. So I, I don't accept this idea that all Argentinians have to go back to wherever they came from and they have to give all the land to 
the descendants of 200,000 people, I, I think that that would be uh, in, inappropriate or improper. So there are parallels. Uh, again, I think you, you get some land title. You don't get as much or uh, as fully, but you, you gotta get some. I mean, otherwise, where would they be that, you know, you're standing? Just by standing, you get something, at least the right to stand. And they did more than that. So it's sort of a moderate position philosophically, or rather radical philosophically, but again, practically, it certainly does not have those implications. Um, Billy, and then this, and wait, you know. uh, I believe after uh, 1964, that that society has given a reparation to the, the black, black people. Specifically is, you have a percentage of government employees at the beginning were colored. To get into the university, you had a percentage of color. Then you got involved the Latins and the, and the Asians, etc. But at the beginning, and I remember a lawsuit in California, a fellow who applied to medical school, he had a top grade, white, and it was given to a colored fellow who had half his grade. Now that fellow won the lawsuit six years later, but it's too late. Now, the same is the damage you were talking about. What is my damage of not being able to get a government job because I don't, I'm not a Latin now, or black, or oriental? This is damage. It damage to my profit, property. And is it a damage? How do you measure that? 40 years. Yeah, I can't go to medical school, the top medical schools, because the percentage are Latinos today, but it started with colored Latinos. So that is a reparation to two other Latinos, which do not need it, but it was started with, with, with the colored people. Well, I think that this is a very good argument against Randall Robinson. Because Randall Robinson says, take all money from whites and give it to all blacks. So I think this is a very good argument. By the way, do you know what happened to the black guy who did go to medical school? No. He went to medical school and he specialized in, um, what is it when you make people prettier? Um, plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. <laughs> and he killed three people. <laughs> and he lost his medical license. Uh, one of them was this white guy, did he get in? No, they didn't get him. But uh, to just show what, what craziness uh, occurred, I mean, he, he became a plastic surgeon and killed people. I mean, plastic surgery, you don't usually think of killing anyone, but he was so incompetent that he actually killed people and lost his license. This is a, a disgrace. So I think it's a very good argument against Randall Robinson, but I don't think it touches libertarianism at all. Because libertarianism says we should only give stuff to the great-grandchildren of slaves who can prove that they're the great-grandchildren of slaves. And here, we're giving all blacks uh, a head start, 30 points, or whatever it is. So it, it, it's not really... I had the argument in reverse. I came 10 years ago to the States. Why should I be blocked from having a government job or, or, uh, or when you go to university, I am paying without having nothing to do with the slaves. I agree, but and again, I think this is a very good critique of Randall Robinson and the left-wing blacks who want massive reparations, but I don't think it has anything to do with the libertarian reparations, because libertarian reparations not only go to blacks who were slaves, or if there were any whites who were slaves, go to them too, but it comes from only slave owners or their grandchildren like the lady with the red shirt. Yeah. <laughs> you rotten, you, you rotten kid you. Uh, so I, I think uh, Mr. Yates makes very good points, but they don't impact what I'm saying, they impact what Randall Robinson is saying, and I certainly agree with Horowitz's criticism of Randall Robinson, but you know, it's sort of like shooting fish in a barrel to criticize a left winger. <laughs> it's more fun to criticize somebody who's got a brain. <laughs> I think Horowitz, Horowitz is wrong, but he's a bright guy. Whereas Randall Robinson is just crazy. Uh, let me call on you and then I'll get you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a little bit worried because you say that owner got that plantation. The way <clears throat> the owner got the plantation were two ways. 
One, he might have homesteaded some of it himself before slaves, although these plantations were very so he big. Worked. He worked. He might have grabbed that plantation. He might have a little bit, but most of the uh, homesteading was done by the slaves. So let's say that uh, this, the plantation was 600 acres, and 500 acres were homesteaded by the, the slaves, and 100 acres was homesteaded by him. Yes. I say all 600 go. He, his grandchildren can't get any of them. The 500 is clear. The slaves homesteaded that, so they should get that. Mm -hmm. But what about the 100 acres that he had, or the coach that he had, that he earned honestly from non-slavery? Mm -hmm. Too bad. Too bad on him. Why? He's, he's a criminal. He's a kidnapper. Uh, he stole the lives of people, generations of people. He now should be made a slave if justice were done. And slaves can't own any property that their masters don't want them to own. Look, suppose I kidnap someone and, and uh, I have a million dollars. Well, let me talk a little bit about libertarian punishment theory. You're going to love this. I'm glad you're sitting down because if you weren't, you'd keel over. <laughs> libertarian punishment theory is very draconian, very tough. And it consists of two teeth for a tooth plus cost of capture plus scaring. Let me explain. So I steal a, a TV set from this gentleman. Well, the first thing I have to do is give back his TV set. That's just the second. What I did to him has to be done to me, namely I have to give him my own TV set. So that's two teeth. Not 1.9 teeth, not 2.1 teeth, two teeth. If I don't have my own TV set, I have to give him money to buy a TV set. Now, if after I steal his TV set, I go to the police right away and say, hey, I, I feel guilty, I stole his TV set, here it is. Do unto me what you have to do because I'm a criminal. Well, then there are no costs of capture. But if, in addition to stealing his TV set, I hide, and I don't tell anyone that I've got his TV set, and you all start looking for me, and it takes three years to capture me, I have to pay you for looking. You're all deputized police people, so I have to pay you. And that's very expensive. And the fourth one is a doozy. The fourth one is scaring me. i got to scare me, because I scared him. Now, how do you scare me? You go like this? No, you I have to play Russian roulette. Oh. I have to play Russian roulette, and the number of bullets and the number of chambers has to be proportionate to how badly I scared him. Now, if all I did was uh, I engaged in fraud, I wrote a bad check, or pickpocketing very delicately, he didn't even know. Not so, not so many bullets and a lot of chambers. <laughs> because I didn't really scare him that much. On the other hand, if I came at him with a gun and I said, give me your TV or I'll shoot you, he's very scared. And I don't care if he's Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's not scared of anything. I'm talking about the average man. You come to the average man with a gun and say, give me your TV set or I'll shoot you, they're scared. This also gets around the problem of Bill Gates stealing a TV set. And so he pays in his own TV set, and uh, he pays for the cost of capture. It doesn't mean anything because he's a billionaire. But he has to play Russian roulette, and his victim can now make a deal with him and say, look, you owe me a Russian roulette. However, if you give me uh, $10 billion, I'll let you out. So it gets out of that problem. Now it gets, let's get back to your question. Mm -hmm. Here is a guy who didn't steal a TV set. He stole the labor of uh, 500 people. Got to play Russian roulette. He's got a, a cost of capture. Uh, he's got to pay all of the labor that he stole. If he owns anything, the other hundred acres, or a coach, or a jewelry, or something, it all goes. He he can't keep anything. As a matter of practical uh, empirical reality, now it might be if Bill Gates was a slave owner, maybe he could keep some property. I don't know, but that would be very unusual. That's more a, a, a German, no? The German kind of law, the reparation you're talking, no? Well, the family had to, to work for the other family who was damaged. Well, not the family. I mean, the, the family of the slave owner, uh, now we're not talking about adult children who were slave men, but suppose he had a 10-year-old kid. Innocent. 
not the family. All right. The, the sins of the father don't go to, that was the no. question you were asking. Yes. Do the sins of the father go to the son to the grandchild? No. no. The, the, the children are innocent. Now, if the, the son is uh, 25 years old and is actively taking part in the slaving, then he is guilty also. But if the 10-year-old uh, uh, doesn't know anything about this, 10-year-olds can't be guilty of anything like that because of what their fathers did. 10-year-olds can do bad things. But, but that 10-year-old gets older and during 120 years or 100 years, he worked that plantation. If the 10-year-old becomes a slave owner himself, then he's guilty. But if, if 1865 comes and we end slavery and he's 10 years old, he doesn't pay anything. Now the property he was given, he shouldn't have been given. That property goes to other people. He doesn't go to jail. Yes? yes. Um, I was thinking about the sentence that you said, that it doesn't matter who benefits from uh, slavery, but who violated the rights of the slaves. Mm. So I was wondering if uh, the American government is also to blame and if the descendants of slaves can sue the government because the government was supposed to protect the rights of all individuals in the U.S. and by allowing uh, slave owners to have slaves, the government failed to protect the rights of the slaves, right? So wouldn't it be logical for them to sue the government, in which case the people of the United States will be affording the cause of reparations. Well, I disagree with that on a lot of counts. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm an anarchist. So I don't believe that the role of the government is to protect the people. I think the role of the government is to steal from the people. <laughs> but let's suppose we put that to the side. I still don't believe in suing governments. I only believe in suing individual people. You can't sue a corporation. There's no such thing as a corporation. You can't grab a corporation. You can't grab a government. They're only individual people. The Nazis in, at the end of World War II could have said, well, go put the, uh, go execute the government. We're innocent. No. There were specific people who, uh, as an Austrian economist, I'm interested in methodological individualism. Only individuals can act. Groups can't act. Groups can act if all you mean is that a bunch of individual people acted in concert, fine, as a shorthand. But there is no such thing as a group over and above the individuals who comprise it. So if you have a, a lynch party of 30 people that lynch an innocent person, each of those people is guilty, individually. So I don't think you should be able to sue government, even if government was the institution that protected people and, and should have and did individuals. Abraham Lincoln? Sure. <laughs> Let's get him. <laughs> and, and all of his descendants. So that would be my answer to your problem. And, and this is very similar to my debate with Warwick's. When, when I say that people who have rent control or minimum wage or tariffs or price controls or whatever should go to jail or be penalized, I mean individuals, not the entire Senate. Ron Paul, uh, Always, he's called Dr. No. He always votes against every, everything that's bad. Well, you shouldn't be able to sue him. He's innocent. I mean, when we have the Libertarian Nuremberg trial, Ron Paul might go in the dock as being a uh, House of Representatives, but he would be declared innocent. Whereas those other individuals who voted for these bad things, they would be responsible. So we sort of agreed partially. But again, we're talking uh, 1860s, and a lot of time has gone by, so it'd be hard to prove this. But if if you had a crystal ball, you know, that gave you f accurate information of everything, or you adopted God's eye view that God knows everything, I'm an atheist also, but you know, <laughs> using this just as a metaphor, then yes, justice would require that we go after the people responsible not only for slavery, but for taking up the position of so-called protecting people and not doing it? Sure. Yes? Yes, in connection with the previous um, question, um, I think that even if you're a methodological individualist, you can um, there are certain legal aspects of it that, for example, you can create a corporation 
we, we can legally create legal persons that can be responsible for certain acts, and you can claim against those, those um, for example, for a, a corporation. The capital of the corporation is separate from the capital of the individuals that take part of that corporation. Um, in the same way, you can claim or you can present a suit against a, st a state as a legal person that has its own capital different from the capital of the individuals that take part of that, of that organization. That is my, my first point. The second point is it has nothing to do with this, and it's previously another point that you have uh, talked before is about discrimination. I don't know if I, uh, perhaps I misunderstood your point because of the ad absurdum argument that you have presented, but um, don't you think that there are certain differences between the choices that one can make in your, our own private lives and in, in comparison with certain situations where you can provide public services such as if you are in a school or is public uh, transportation, a church, etc. Um, and there's a difference between my own choices in my own life and in principle um, discriminating group because of their color, etc. Uh, not to provide certain services or to provide a differential services. Don't you think that there are certain differences? I think those are both very good questions, and since I'm a professor, I'm never allowed to answer questions directly, <coughs> so I'll, I'll answer a different question, <laughs> uh, one that I know about, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll get to you. Uh, the question, the related question that you didn't ask that I want to discuss is the blacks in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. Why didn't some black guy or a white guy set up another bus company and say, look, blacks, you can sit in the front, you can sit in the back, I don't care, I might charge you more, or not, but I'll get all the customers from this main one. Why didn't somebody set up another bus company? The reason is that in order to set up a bus company, you had to get a franchise or a permit from the government, from the same government that had the, the, the Jim Crow. So if we had a free enterprise system, uh, it would be very difficult to keep blacks in the back of a bus or in the back of a luncheonette or in the back of anything. Okay. Now to get to your second question first. Why do I make a distinction between personal sex uh, choices, romance choices, and people should be free there, but in business they shouldn't be free because if I open a grocery store or a, a, a restaurant, I should be forced to serve everyone. Well, I don't make such fine distinctions. Why should I make it? Property is property. Why should I? I mean, if the law is just, that you shouldn't discriminate, shouldn't it apply to everything? If it's impermissible to discriminate in a luncheonette or a, a, a bookstore or a transportation, shouldn't it also be, for the same reason, impermissible to discriminate in terms of romantic relationships? Why not? Look, we say that it's wrong to steal uh, the, this newspaper, and we also say it's wrong to rape. And one is personal and one isn't. And we don't make such distinctions as libertarians. We say they're both wrongs. So if the lefties who say we have no right to discriminate in business are correct, we can extrapolate. We can make a reductio ad absurdum. And we can say, well, if you can't discriminate here because discrimination is per se a crime, why not in the personal life? I mean, if, if you're so bloody against discriminating, why uh, allow people to discriminate in this area but not in that area? We don't allow uh, people to uh, punch people uh, uh, in biz business but not personally. If, if a husband beats up a wife, wife abuse in the home, it's just as bad as uh, hits his secretary in, in the work. We don't make a distinction. A punch is a punch. Well, discrimination is discrimination. And if you discriminate in the business, uh, or if you can't discriminate in the business, by what right should you be able to do it in your personal life? On the other hand, if you should be able to discriminate in your personal life, well, then you should be able to discriminate anywhere, because discrimination is not a crime. Either it's a crime or it's not a crime. And I don't see any justification for making that sharp distinction. Now, your other question, I haven't forgotten, is can you sue corporations or governments? And with regard to a corporation, let's say we make a corporation, everybody puts in $1,000 and now we have $20,000 or $25,000. And what we say is if you deal with us commercially, 
we're only obligated to up to 25,000. However, if we have a bus company and we tell the bus drivers to kill innocent people, there's no limit of 25,000 because now we're committing a crime, not a tort. But for a tort, what we, it's a contractual thing. It's not a privilege. It's a contract. We're saying, look, if you want to deal with us and something goes wrong, you can only sue us up to 25,000. And you don't, if you don't like it, don't deal with us. But if you do like it, and you sign a contract, well then you can't violate the contract. So I, I think uh, government is very different than a corporation because in my view as an anarchist, government is per se an invasive force. They force you to pay taxes, uh, they prohibit competition. So government would be different. But with regard to a corporation, I, I don't think you can sue a corporation you only sue individuals, or you sue the corporate kitty for the 25000 that we have. So that would be the general. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think uh, one one team. team. <laughs> yeah. About uh, the, the current debate in Argentina is between uh, gay or straight wedding. And uh, another point is our polygamic relationships. Uh, I will. Uh, make a quotation about the study that uh, points that between tw 20 and 30 years a man thinks in sex every 56 seconds and women one or four times a day depending on the moment of the month. So, uh, and that uh, uh, happens not only in human beings but in other uh, kinds of monkeys <laughs> and uh, mammals. So, uh, What's your opinion? Some cultures in the world allow uh, polygamic relationships. Uh, in our societies, uh, this uh, is allowed, uh, not allowed uh, legally sometimes, but uh, informally it is. Uh, I would like to know your opinion about the legalization of this uh, kind of relationships. Well, you know, sometimes the people talk about edu uh, religion, and they say there should be separation of church and state. I think there should be separation of everything in state. <laughs> state should have nothing to do with marriage. It should be like a business contract. Uh, we have this contract, you two have that contract, you and I have this contract. None of the government's business. So if people want to have uh, homosexual relations or heterosexual, the, the government should be indifferent if we have a government, which I'm afraid we do. But given that we have a government, the government should make no distinction between uh, hetero or homosexual, and it should make no difference between a two-person marriage and a, a ten-person marriage, or a five-person marriage, and it doesn't have to be polygamy or polyandry, which would be one woman and five husbands. It could be three husbands and four wives, or whatever relationship people want to make, uh, and then they should have in their contract, well, suppose we split up, and uh, what should we do with the house that we live in? And, uh, and then if we have a government and it's, it's uh, in charge of law, it should just uphold the contract, whatever the contract is. And it shouldn't say, well, this contract isn't in the public interest. Oh, I, I forgot, uh, on your point, uh, when I open a grocery, I don't open it to the public. I open it to just the people I want in my restaurant. Uh, it depends on the law and it depends if you have several. The law denies it. But when I open, I assure you, when I open a restaurant, I open it just for people that I want to serve. There's no such thing as open to the public. Look, suppose I go on a dating thing like eHarmony, have eHarmony or match.com. Uh, you can say I'm open to the public. No, I'm not open to the public. I'm just open to whoever I find attractive. So this distinction between the private and the public and the personal, I don't think it makes sense for libertarianism. It might make sense for other people, but not for libertarians. Yes? Yeah, uh, going back to uh, reparations for the Indians, for example, I remember once watching uh, an interview with uh, Leonard Peikoff, whom you're probably familiar with, and when they're asking him about reparation for Indians, he was saying, that they don't have any, they can't have any claims because they own land collectively. So, what's your view on that? He's crazy. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with owning? You know, the Randians are weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
for them, the worst thing is collectivism. Collectivism is fine if it's voluntary. Look, let me draw something else for you people. Here is socialism, here is capitalism, here is voluntary, here is coercive. Now most people think that the debate is between capitalism and socialism. No! The debate isn't between capitalism and socialism. The debate is between voluntary and coercive. Let me fill in the boxes to illustrate what I mean. So we have voluntary capitalism, that's laissez-faire capitalism. That's the good stuff. But we also have a thing called coercive capitalism, where you have the veneer of capitalism, but you have heavy regulation, and it's called fascism. You have a veneer of capitalism, Mussolini, uh, Hitler situation. You had private companies with Hitler. Krupp and Stuka and BMW were private companies, and Hitler would tell them what to do. What we have in the U.S. is more fascism than socialism. Socialism being government ownership, very little government ownership except for land, and now they took over an automobile company. But most is regulation, so it's mostly fascism. Okay, uh, coercive socialism is uh, the USSR or Cuba. We know all about that. But what is voluntary socialism? The kibbutz, the monastery, the nunnery, the family, where they believe in each from uh, according to his ability to each according to his need. As long as it's voluntary, it's fine. When my daughter was three years old, she ate, not in accordance with her ability to earn income, but in accordance with uh, her needs. It was determined by my wife. Everything was determined by my wife. That's another issue. Uh, the, the kibbutz, they share. It's a collective. What's wrong? Yeah, you might not want to join this collective. You, you might have a family. And in most families, they share money. I remember when my kids were small, I was having a, bet, uh, having a dispute with my wife. And I said, I'll bet you 10000 And my daughter, very clever, she's about five years old, said, that's silly, they share money. <laughs> so what's a $10,000 bet? Well, that's, my family is a collective. Most families are collective. The kibbutz, the monastery, uh, I work for the Loyola um, Jesuits. The Jesuit order is a collective. Now, I have many things against them, but not because they agree to uh, be a group. So the Randians are just wrong when they think that collectivism is the bad thing. And if the Indians are justified in having something, they're justified in having it uh, if they're a collective or individually, it doesn't matter <coughs> from the libertarian point of view. But the Randians aren't libertarians. Rand used to uh, dismiss us as hippies of the right because uh, you know we have different views on among other things, collectivism and government. I mean, I'm, don't get me started on Ayn Rand, but, you know. <laughs> uh, she had this thing about uh, Berkeley. When the student rebellion was taking over Berkeley University, she was against the hippies. And I said, wait, isn't Berkeley a public university? Aren't we against public universities? It's true they were Marxist and hippies taking it over, but still, Whenever a government institution uh, is under attack, we have to applaud. Uh, the Wisconsin thing, when the, uh, the unions, uh, have you heard about this? The, the public sector unions in Wisconsin were rioting that they want more money. And all the conservatives said, oh, they're, they're evil. And I said, but who are they fighting? They're fighting the government of Wisconsin. The government of Wisconsin is not innocent. It's sort of like when the Nazis fight the commies, you cheer both of them on to kill each other because they're both bad. Right? Now, I'm not a fan of unions. Unions are per se, almost per se, uh, an invasive group. But when the union is fighting the government, you don't necessarily take the government side. The government too is evil, an abomination for libertarians. 
So I, I think that the, the Randians are, are wrong. They're, she once wrote this thing about uh, the moon shot. Remember when, when we landed some taxpayers on the moon? <laughs> and she was saying, this is great. $25 billion in 1960 or 1950, I forget when it was, 58? I don't remember what it was. That's a lot of money that they took from us. Why, if we want to go to the moon, private enterprise will get us to the moon and, uh, at, at a certain price. There are now people uh, promising trips to the moon privately. If you pay a certain amount, they'll bring some green cheese back. You know, the moon is made of green cheese and we'll bring some back. <laughs> So I disagree entirely with Peacock, who is Rand's heir. On the other hand, Rand has done magnificent work in promoting liberty. So anything I say has to be taken, any criticism, we have to balance it by saying, look, uh, she probably created more libertarians, even though she wasn't a libertarian and she disliked libertarianism, than pretty much anyone else at the shrug. It's a magnificent book. It's my favorite novel. If any of you haven't read Out of the Shrug, I order you to read it. <laughs> well, libertarianism, okay in theory, but if you want to get something done, you have to order people with the threat of a gun. So, <laughs> I, mean, well, I threaten you that if you don't read Out of the Shrug, I'm going to plug you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes jokes uh, don't get across. But uh, <laughs> the other problem with Ayn Rand is she had all sorts of other theories on metaphysics, epistemology, Aesthetics and you know, I like Mozart, Bach, Haydn, Handel, and Vivaldi, Baroque. For her, uh, Rachmaninoff was rational, and, and Baroque was no good. <laughs> you know, what's that got to do with libertarianism? I mean, it's just you know, I like vanilla ice cream, you like chocolate ice cream, it's not a libertarian issue. So, I'm not a big fan of hers, but on the other hand, I acknowledge she's created more libertarians than anyone else, and also me, personally. She and Nathaniel Brandon personally converted me from left liberalism or left pinkoism or whatever it was that I was, <laughs> and they made me limited government libertarians like them. So, I have a personal uh, debt to her. And I acknowledge that she's created more libertarians than anyone else, including Ron Paul and, and uh, Hayek and Mises and Friedman. I mean, that book, it's still selling. It came out in 57, 1957. It'll be 100 years old soon, and it's still selling like 100,000 copies a year. Random House uh, did a survey, and they took all of the customers of Random House, and they said, what are the top 100 books? And Ayn Rand had six five or four or five books in the top 10. And then they took the same survey of the Random House employees. Rand's books didn't make the top 100, which shows what the New York Times type people think of her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Random House employees read the New York Times, which is you know, a code word for everything evil. <laughs> Maybe we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. And I wanted to ask you two questions, please. Sure. The first one is that, if I'm not mistaken, on, on human action, Mises wrote that um, if we trace back the origins of property, all were uh, related with blood, violence, and theft. But that didn't matter because in, a, in an open market, in a free market, you know, the market allocates the resources where they should be. So reparations, it seems, shouldn't be an issue because you know, if that's a free market, that, that, will, that will work. And the second question is that if we realize that reparations should be given to, to the, the, the descendants of, of the, 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 the slaves who worked in the, in, the, in the plantations, isn't the theory that you presented to us very difficult for them to get the reparations? So in a way, it's not not so, it doesn't help them much. Let me answer the second one first. You're quite right. It doesn't help them much as a matter of practical importance, but I don't care. I'm interested in justice and what libertarian theory is. And I call them where I see them and let the chips fall where they may. And it does help the Japanese Americans and it does help the Jews from Germany because it's more recent. 
it doesn't help the blacks or the Indians or the natives because it's older and, and we have less proof. So you're right, it, it shouldn't give them much practical comfort, but I'm not interested in giving anyone comfort. I'm interested in tracing out the non-aggression axiom and homesteading and libertarian theory. And I don't care who it helps and who it hurts. Uh, the first question, I think, the, we have to make a distinction between the normative and the positive. Normative is what should be, what's ethical, what's just. Positive is what causes what, how do we understand reality. Now Mises was making a positive statement. He was saying if you go back long enough in the history of anything, practically, you'll find some theft. Either that's true or it's false. I think it's true. But I'm, I'm not in that universe of discourse. I'm saying, well, what should we do when we find such a case? What should we do? It's a normative thing. So he and I are not contradicting each other. When there's no inconsistency between him saying that if you go back far enough, you'll find theft. I think that's roughly true. Maybe not 100%, but 95% true. Maybe there's some ice flow in Alaska that it's not true of, but for most things, it's true. But I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, when it's true, what should we do? But I understand what you're saying, but there are, as you, as you should know, there are, you know, like, Two different, two different kinds of justification for property. The historical one and the, and the, and the public one. You know, the, the historical might be, should there be reparations for these people because they were, and the public one, it has to do, it, 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 it is more utilitarian or consequentialist. And, and I think those, uh, th those two views can, you know, like, uh, collide and you have to choose, There's a, or at least you have to, be, to know that there can be a problem there. Well, now I think you're asking a different question, and I agree with you on this one. There is a difference between utilitarianism and deontological libertarian law. For example, suppose the Martians send out a message that unless we kill the cameraman, <laughs> the whole Earth gets killed. Well, we should kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but this is we just keep him anyway. <laughs> I think I've stumbled on something. Uh, so obviously the utilitarian answer is kill him, and the libertarian answer is don't kill him because it violates the non-aggression answer. So there's obviously a distinction to be made, and whenever there's a distinction to be made, I try to stick to the principles of libertarianism. And then I try to dance around and soften up <laughs> examples like this. And what I say is, libertarianism doesn't say thou shalt not kill, strictly speaking, it just gives punishment theory. It just says if you kill, what happens to you? So what I predict would happen would be there'd be some hero who would go and kill him, and then we'd have a ticker tape parade in his honor, and then we'd execute him. He'd be a hero because he saved the world, and he knew he'd be killed because he's a libertarian and he subscribes to the libertarian punishment theory. The problem is when the Martians say, well, if you carry out, then we'll blow the earth up again. Namely, if you execute this hero, then we'll that could blow be the you. earth. <laughs> uh, and I haven't solved that one yet. <laughs> but notice how weird we have to go before we get problems. We have to make up Martians who are purposely trying to uh, undermine libertarian theory and with the threat of blowing up the world. Well, I think libertarian theory is not perfect. It doesn't fully answer these questions, but you know, what the heck? We're doing pretty well. 99.999 is pretty good. The other problem I have with libertarianism, and I haven't had a solution to that, and I'll and with asking you people to think about it and email me if you find a solution is, I don't like torturing animals. Call me a weirdo. I just don't like it. But I acknowledge that if we can kill animals to eat them, and I think we can, it seems hard to say that you can't torture them too. And I don't like it. I'm trying to come up with a way around this <laughs> problem. So if anyone can <clears throat> think of something, See, I don't, I'm not satisfied with a boycott. 
First of all, they can do it in secret, we never know, but even if they do it publicly, a boycott seems very uh, mild punishment for these devils who would take a cat and light them up, and burn, you know, just despicable things that people do to animals. And I'd really like to get them, but I can't reconcile the Batarian theory with that. And I'm working on it, and I'll try to wiggle around and come up with something. <laughs> That the, the, the aim of, of the activity is different. You know, uh, um, torturing animals is enjoying in suffering, seeing others suffer pain, and killing perhaps just to eat you. So maybe one principle you would take you to kill the animals with a lower level of pain possible. Well, you're right. Torturing someone is worse than cleanly murdering a person. And uh, you should give them a bigger punishment, but still, if you can murder an animal, it seems a, we need a, a criteria to distinguish murdering an animal or killing an animal for food, uh, humanely, cleanly, without suffering, and then torturing for the purpose of suffering. And I haven't nailed this one down yet. I don't have a, a theory that satisfies me. Try a beef in chorizo before you go back. A beef in chorizo, I would have a steak. Well, thanks for your attention. Thank you. well, in the U.S., there are about 370 million people. And if you go up in an airplane west of the Mississippi, it looks like no one's there. The whole place is empty. Even east of the Mississippi, you see uh, uh, Chicago, you see Memphis, and then darkness at night. The, the place is empty. There are very, very few people there. The estimates are that when the white man came and started killing the Indians, there were only two million Indians. Many tribes, but each tribe, uh, 200, 300, very small tribes, altogether two million. So if 375 million can't fill the United States. Two million, they couldn't occupy very much. Maybe a percent or two or three percent of the land. So the issue does not even arise. Even assuming they can prove anything, which is problematic, because there was no written language, no photographs or anything like that. In Canada, the Indian tribes have claimed about 300% of Canada. <laughs> Namely, there are many tribes, uh, several hundred tribes, and each tribe says, oh, we own this and we own that, and there are overlapping claims. So when you add up all the claims, they own 300% of Canada. But there's only 100% of Canada, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the law of logic. You can't create more than 100% of Canada. So somebody must be lying. And, and the courts, instead of asking for proof, this would be racist to ask for proof. <laughs> they say, here's some old Indian, he says, ah, oh, we own from this uh, river to that river. And they listen to him. This is not justice. Justice means you have to prove something. The burden of proof is on he who wants to change titles, not on hearsay and, oh, my grandfather told me this, we own this from this tree to that boulder. This isn't proper uh, legal procedure. Now, there are some cases where there was a treaty between the United States government and the tribe, and then they discovered the coal and they kicked them off, and, and there there is written record. Okay, that would be more legitimate. But in the vast number of cases, th there's just no claim for that situation as well. But in the US, Black people were captured from Africa, taken to the U.S., and forced to work. And then in 1865, when the war between the states was over, slavery was ended. So what should have happened then in a libertarian society? What should have happened then is that the slave masters and the overseers and the people who brutalized slaves should have been punished. They should have been enslaved. And all their property should have been taken away from them because the slave can't own any property. And these people are now properly slaves, namely they're criminals and they're being punished. 
This, as an aside, is the libertarian theory of punishment. If I take her watch, I should be not only made to give it back, but I should be put in jail, but not put in, you see, right now, I'm put in jail, and she has to pay more money to keep me in jail. And I have air conditioning, at least in the United States, I have a color TV, and a, it's a wonderful thing, jail. Well, not that one. <laughs> but she's victimized twice. Once, I, I take her watch, and secondly, I go to jail, and she pays for me through taxes to be in jail. No, I should be put in jail and made to engage in forced labor, and the difference between the amount that I can earn in forced labor and what it costs to feed me should go to her, to compensate her for the theft that I imposed on her. But that's an aside. Okay, so slavery, 1865, it's over. And uh, all of the property of the ex-slave masters should go to the slaves. So here's a plantation, there are 500 slaves. Let's say we divide the land and the cattle and everything else in 500 pieces. So now each slave gets uh, 10 acres and a mule, something like that. And that would have been justice. But it didn't happen. What happened was slavery was ended and then the slaves were set free to, to work. And the master kept his plantation. And now it's uh, 2011, and there's some black person who lives in Harlem, which is a black area in New York City, and he comes to the Libertarian Justice Court and says, my great-grandfather worked on that uh, plantation in South Carolina. And I can prove it. The burden of proof is on me. For the Libertarian, any property title is assumed to be just. The burden of proof is on anyone who wants to change property titles. So this black person comes to the court, and the, the court uh, says, well, prove it. And he proves it. Don't ask how. There's a picture. I don't know if there were pictures then. See, the problem with proving, you see, this is a very radical position philosophically. But practically, the further back you go in history, the harder it is to prove anything. We don't have pictures. If you go back to the Indians, native Indians in the US, you don't even have a written language. So it's harder to prove. But if it could be proved that this guy uh, had his great grandfather on this plantation, uh, and there were 500 slaves, he should get one 500th of that plantation. It seems just to return stolen property because in the just society, his great-grandfather would have had uh, 10 acres of that plantation. Now it's possible, again, the, the white person who is now the great-grandchild of the slave master, he might say, well, you know, this is mine. I got it from my father, but he never should have got it. It was unfair for his father and grandfather to give it to him because he was not the proper owner of it. Okay, that's for slavery. That was the second part of my analysis. Now, the third part, and then I have some objections that I'll deal with. The third part is, well, what about Indian claims? Should we give back the whole United States back to the Indians? Because the Indians were there first. The white people came and brutalized them, killed many, and threw the rest of them off their land. Maybe we should give it all back. No. Usually when I, I say this to American audiences, I get applause. <laughs> they they want to keep their land. They don't want to give it all back to the Indians. Right now, uh, I am going to discuss reparations in three stages. First, I'll introduce libertarianism, which is the philosophy from which I will analyze reparations. Second, I will try to apply reparations to slavery. And third, I'll try to apply the libertarian theory uh, of reparations to land reparations from Indians or uh, people such as that. Conquistadores. So first, what is libertarianism? Libertarianism is the philosophy that 
is predicated on the non-aggression principle. It says you can do anything you want as long as you keep your hands off of other people and their property. So this opens up the question, well, how do you get property? Well, we start with the individual. We each own ourselves. Sort of homesteading. Uh, when my children were uh, six months old or a year old, I could kiss them all the time I wanted. No problems. <laughs> then they became about two years old and they start going like this. <laughs> like they're taking control of their bodies. They, they seem to think they own themselves, which is horrible because <laughs> I was having a great time kissing them all I wanted and now they seem to own themselves. They're sort of homesteading themselves. When they're six months old, they're not really in control of themselves at all. Two or three, they start to own themselves. So we own ourselves. Therefore, slavery is a theft. Unless it's voluntary slavery. So if one of my children is very sick, and uh, what's your name? Marcelo. Marcelo wants to have me as a slave, but he's very rich, and my child will die unless I have five million dollars, and Marcelo will give me five million, I'll give it to my, my son's doctors, will save his life, and now I'm his slave, because I agreed to be. But that's very unusual. Usually slavery is somebody grabs you and makes you a slave. Okay, so we have the non-aggression principle and we have homesteading of the person first and then we have homesteading of land. How do you get to own land? Well, you mix your labor with it. This is John Locke, John Locke's theory. You mix your labor, you grow a crop, you domesticate a cow and the cows uh, eat the, the corn and now you own the, the fields. Okay, so this is roughly a very short introduction to what libertarianism is non-aggression, private property, persons and in land. And then we have another legitimate title transfer. Once you own land, you can trade it if you want. So if I uh, domesticate a cow and you grow corn, and I milk the cow and I trade the milk for the corn, now I have corn even though I didn't produce the corn, and you have milk even though you didn't produce the milk, that's also legitimate. Any voluntary interaction such as trade or gifts or anything like that. Okay, so that's the introduction to libertarian theory. A lot of people on the right think that reparations is theft. But to me, it's not true. Uh, if, uh, what, what's your name? Vera. 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 If I stole this watch, if my grand, if I stole this watch from Vera, and she repossesses it, this is just because it's her watch and I took it from her. Now suppose my grandfather took it from her grandfather and my grandfather gave it to my father and my father gave it to me and now she sees me wearing the watch and she has pictures of her grandfather wearing it and we assume that it really is his. We adopt the God's eye view so we don't uh, dispute this. Well, and she comes to me and says, well, that's my watch, give it back. Or my grandfather would have given it to my father, and my father would have given it to me, so you give it to me because you never should have had this in the first place. It seems just. I should give her the watch. And this is not a violation of property rights. This is the embodiment of property rights. This is the way property rights should work. We should take stuff from the thief and give it to the proper owner. No, I'm not a thief. I'm innocent. I shouldn't go to jail. I shouldn't be punished. But I have no right to this watch. Okay. Slavery. We have slaves. Slavery is unjust. We're not talking voluntary slavery. And most of my experiences in the US, I don't know the Argentines.